We are on page 35, stanza 131. Page 35, stanza 131. Through familiarization of the preceding moments, the mental qualities such as loving kindness and non-attachment will become the, okay, we have to change the translation a little bit, uh, will become the basis, basis for their manifestations, for their manifestations in some, in some, and then the, after some, put in bracket, practitioners will become the basis for their manifestations in some practitioners. It's just the, from the Sanskrit to the Tibetan to the English. So this some means in the, the practitioners. But because it is there, I should keep it there. Through familiarization of the preceding moments of the mental qualities, such as loving kindness, you practice it and non-attachment. We practice this then they will become the basis for the manifestations, meaning, meaning that the compassion that you practice, it becomes more, it manifests more and more, um, more and more intensity, more and more, I say, the, the quality. So they will manifest in the, form, the, in the full form. In some, in some meaning, the beings who practice, practitioners, yeah. Through practice, the mind will have the nature of loving kindness. Nature of loving kindness, meaning the mind, say, the, um, say generally the person, okay, generally the person may not be so kind. And then suddenly um, you come across a text or you meet with your friends who talk about compassion. Then you, okay, compassion is important. And then although the mind is not, from the mind, is not really coming, but then you put effort to practice compassion. It is like, so your mind flows in one way, and the compassion you are trying to mimic. It's not really become the nature of the mind. You practice, practice, eventually it becomes the nature of mind. The moment you see somebody, um, the, depending on the, how profound is your compassion. Your compassion, of course, there are three kinds. Compassion, three kinds. Compassion, um, the compassion directed towards the mere sentient being, number one. Compassion directed towards the mere sentient being. Then number two, compassion directed towards the phenomena. Then the compassion directed, to the, then number three is the non-referential compassion. Non-referential compassion. Number one, compassion directed towards the mere sentient being. Number two, compassion directed towards the phenomena. Number three, compassion, the non-referential compassion. Okay, these three compassions are there. And the, how these three compassions, they are um, distinguished is on the basis of, okay, compassion, if you remember last time, I did mention that the compassion, uh, to cultivate compassion, we need uh, two things to keep in mind. One is the, 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 what is to be cultivated as a subject, cultivating the subject, means you should train the mind to be loving towards all beings. Train the mind, the subject should be trained to love others. Then the, for the compassion, unique thing is the object, not only the subject, the object. Object, you should, you should see the suffering nature of the beings. You should know the suffering nature of the beings. The morning, the morning practice, we practice the four immeasurables. What are the scores? Okay, tell me. What's the first practice which we did of the four measurables? What's the first measurable? Loving, Loving kindness. Number two? Compassion. Compassion. Number three? Immeasurable joy. Number four? Equanimity. Equanimity. Okay. If you can tell me, these, three, these four practices are very different from each other, but tell me one thing which is so, one thing which is common to all four. What is that? Which hand? Okay, being immeasurable. Okay, this is good. <laughs> Anybody else? Huh? Okay, number of the sentient beings is immeasurable. Okay, this is good. Anybody else? Loving, loving kindness. Okay, let's say, okay, loving kindness. Okay, first I'd like to get information from you. Yes, Jungjibla? Uh, with each of those four, the mind is moving out. 
Spazier gehen. With the mind is moving out. What do you mean by mind is moving out? The mi okay, mind feels close to the uh, close to others. The mind feels close to others. In all four cases, the mind feels close. The mind is not indifferent towards others. The mind is not the the mind is ob not oblivious to others. The mind is not indifferent towards others. The mind really moves. This is known as the feeling of love. What Vinita just said, feeling of love, affection, feeling of closeness. This is so precious. Feeling closeness towards the beings. This is so precious. And in, interesting, although your mind may not have that nature yet, if you practice, it becomes like that. It's a matter of practice. But then, of course, we need to have a very refined steps to practice that. So I personally would say that these two practices, sevenfold cost of a method and the method of equalizing exchange itself for others, these two are so beautiful practice. Okay, this is something the earlier you know you don't really feel that that particularly people who are very difficult ones, you just feel what is that? This is our attitude. Mind does not flow, mind shrinks. But then with the practice, eventually start to flow. It's beautiful, it's amazing. So we have to practice. Say, the subject-wise, the mind flows towards the beings. Subject-wise. Subject-wise, your mind. The subject-wise, which earlier is very oblivious to others. Okay, yeah, there's a problem with, this, with everyone. <laughs> These are attitudes sometimes. Right? Somebody's, oh, compassion to this person. No, this happens to everybody. And then, which means that we are so indifferent, so cold. No, whether they say the whether other person relate to you or not, but at least, or oh, there's a problem there. What if you are in problem? Just visualize the just imagine, imagine that if you are in the problem and somebody says, Okay, no, this problem happens to everybody, so what a big deal? Then you'll feel hurt, you'll feel sad that the other person is so cold towards you. Whereas at least somebody expresses uh, some kind of consolation, some kind of, you know, condolence, some kind of, say, love, just to tell them that I'm there, please let me know what I can do for you. The person will feel, you know, say, the consoled, happy. This is so precious. And this something is not only doable, we practice and it will literally is magic. Earlier, you may not be feeling it. Okay, this is so-so. You practice it, it'll happen, it'll happen. And as the mind flows towards all beings, it's so beautiful, so beautiful. This, you'll f feel that this is the most beautiful mind in this universe, most beautiful mind. And you are so happy. This is the, the say, if this experience, if you, you, know, you can make like a pill, Take it, and if this experience comes to you, all the billionaires will buy this. Guaranteed, this experience is something so precious, so appealing, so tender. Okay, so it's a matter of practice. So now the point is that you cultivate this mind which embraces all sentient beings, number one. Then number two, how profound is this mind? How profound is this mind? Intensity and profundity are just slightly different. Intensity of this mind the more you practice, it can become very intense. And the situations arise, it can become very intense. Now, how profound? How profound? This is a different question. Say, if, if we, let's say, um, if we see, say, if we see somebody who is manifestly so much in pain, then you see the person's situation, you feel so sad so much for the person, to the extent that you just feel like crying yourself, really crying yourself, mind is so alert, crying. This is a very intense feeling. The same, you as the same person, and the other, the object, the other person who was suffering, later on, uh, through some, you know, factors, the, the person becomes, okay, physically the ailment disappears, and the person becomes more, you know, let's say, the more successful, and perhaps, like, equal to you. Then, compassion, okay, now he's normal, perfect, <laughs> right? Now, compassion is not, not, not really there. Okay, then, on another occasion, we see that the person is even more successful than you. 
then jealousy may come in instead of compassion, right? Which means that earlier compassion, which was so intense, the intensity is there, but the profundity is not there. Profundity meaning the suffering. Suffering, there are three layers of suffering. And we can make it even four layers of suffering. The manifest suffering, also referred to as suffering, suffering. Then the suffering change. Then, Shan? Pervasive. Oh, pervasive condition suffering. Then the next one, next, it is uniquely of, uniquely being seen as the poison from the Bodhisattva's part, minor part, which is the cognitive obscuration. Suffering because, suffering of not realizing the, the not realizing omniscience. So from that point of view, if you say, most of the, most of the compassion is directed towards the first suffering, suffering, suffering. Then we feel like crying, helplessness, just wanting to do something to help, console, and so forth. So this is, this is, it can be very intense, but it's not profound. Whereas, if you're able to see that not only the this, this suffering of suffering, but suffering change, this is what binds us in samsara. This is what binds us in samsara. Suffering of su suffering, suffering, everybody wants to run away. But suffering of change, unless one is evolved, unless one is realized, introduced to, to these concepts, one will not feel like running away. Oh, I like cheesecake. Right? Deliberately we go there. So where you see that this is what binds the beings in samsara, then even when somebody is successful, you, you feel compassionate. Now the compassion becomes more profound. Many people will drop compassion at that point when that, that person is more successful than you. Jealousy comes in. Now in your case, you continue to, oh, it's very good that you are successful. I wish that you are even more successful by coming out of samsara. By coming out of samsara. So that is more profound compassion. Then, not only the manifest, not only the suffering of suffering, no, suffering of change, but even the pervasive conditioned suffering. Finally, the self-grasping ignorance. As long as self-grasping ignorance is there, this person is continuously going to be, let's say, under the involuntary pull and push of samsara. So that is where so if it is between, the, generally speaking, if it's between the mother and the child, if the mother is, if the mother has all this knowledge, mother will try her best to make sure that the child learns about pervasive condition of suffering. Because the mother loves the child so much. So with this, then you see that no matter how successful you are, right, as long as you are in the, the, in the grip of the self-grasping ignorance, creating all these dreams of the conventional reality, and then you're getting trapped there, then the compassion is very profound, very profound. Then, even if you are liberated from samsara, self-grasping is gone, still you have not perfected. And as a mother, as a mother towards the child, if the child is also, although very successful, but you see the another one who is really renowned as a Nobel laureate level, then the mother will wish that my child also become a Nobel laureate. Which means that, that this person must become Buddha. Although is arahat, liberated from suffering, but still there's a cognitive obscuration there. Then your compassion becomes even more intense. Even more intense. So this compassion is uniquely with the Bodhisattvas, not with the arahats. Arahats don't have this compassion. So that compassion is very profound. So compassion, there are so many degrees in terms of intensity, in terms of profundity. So we need to work on the compassion, the, the, the both intensity plus and the profundity. So for that, we, are talking, we talked about the three kinds of compassion. Compassion di directed towards the mere sentient beings, compassion directed, the compassion direct, directed towards the phenomenon, then the compassion, the non-referential compassion. Okay, so the first one. The first one is the compassion di directed towards the mere sentient beings, meaning that we have no uh, same, uh, your mind, you don't see the reality of the imp you don't 
uh, you are not really what you call it, say the, uh, the experience of empty, impermanence, experience of emptiness, it's not really there, not really there. You just look at the sentient being, the, the, the other person, and you see the other person suffering in general, suffering in general with the manifest pain, with the manifest pain, and then the, with the manifest pain, you feel compassion, this is the, the first compassion. Compassion directed towards the mere sentient being. Why we added this word mere? It's because this compassion is not complemented by the more profound wisdom. This compassion is not complemented by the wisdom of impermanence. This compassion is not complemented by the wisdom of selflessness, wisdom of emptiness. Because it's not complemented by the deeper realities, the understanding of deeper realities, this compassion becomes quite the uh, more, say, the basic. So this is known as the compassion directed towards the mere sentient beings. Then, your real, as your realization improves, as your realization improves, with the, say, for example, the realization of impermanence, subtle impermanence, where things, say, through practicing, through practicing the impermanent, the, through practicing the wisdom of impermanence, just see how things are moving so fast. Inferring from the very gross change to the subtler, subtler, subtler change. So as we go into this practice, <clears throat> for this practice, I would say that for this practice, wisdom emptiness, so this might just just my personal sharing. Wisdom emptiness, practice of wisdom emptiness and practice of impermanence, I would say that for the practice of impermanence, you the, we need to spend time in isolation, a little bit. A little bit of isolation, meaning just sit, stay by yourself, cut off from the the other people, mixing with other people. So that is um, quite the needed. But as for the wisdom of emptiness, um, it may not this kind of environment. If the environment is there, well and good. Even without this, the wisdom of emptiness can be very effective. But the, with the impermanence. Impermanence, what is happening, the marriage of one, one, the marriage impermanence within us is very weak. Number two, impermanence, how the impermanence is presented and how the, the impermanence come to experience is something which we have never, which we have never the, thought about, thought about in depth, the momentary impermanence. And then the next one is that the imprint is very strong. And then the opposite, the meditation impermanence. So this meditation impermanence, um, say the study of the impermanence, we don't really need a very deep study as such for the impermanence. Not really. For example, to just sharing, I think it, might, it was my first year or the second year of joining the monastery, I sat for the two months retreat, personal retreat not knowing about emptiness, Pramana Vartika far away, right? Not, not knowing about one year, but you're very lucky. Just the first seven years, Pramana Vartika. <laughs> Amazing, right? Not all of you, but some of you new newcomers. So in my case, one year gone, Pramana Vartika far away. Emptiness, what are you talking about? Emptiness after 10 years, right? So the, during this retreat, the situation was very conducive. You may not agree with me that it's conducive, but from my side now, when you look back in time, it was really conducive. Where the, the place, oh, but don't do that. Don't do that, I'm warning you. Because how I was brought up and how you are brought up is very different. Right, don't do that. It can damage your health. So what happened was that the, the place where I was sitting for retreat, the place was literally humid. And the, season was winter and the, uh, it was just facing towards the north direction which means no sun and damp, damp inside and terribly cold snow outside with all these factors in the intact and then it so happened that the, the our institute was on the vacation or the holiday so I was doing my retreat there. And uh, so nothing to meditate, what to meditate? It, I had no emptiness, no class, seven day class, <laughs> right? No seven day class. 
And even three days on Wisdom of Emptiness, even that would be wonderful. Three days on Harsu teaching would be wonderful. Nothing of this. Emptiness far away. Brahmana Vartika, unheard of. Right? Just what you read Lamrim for the what did, what could I understand? My teacher, when Brogin Lamrim Bai, he was he himself was in the 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 hermitage and he advised me just reflect on impermanence. And I was very impermanent, reading the book, and then meditating. Then after, I think like fourth or fifth day, because of the, the sequence, because of the conducive situation to remember the impermanence, it was very conducive situation. Within four or five days, the, the feeling of impermanence was so intense. Literally, that is though like wherever you look, even the walls, you wouldn't believe. I told this to my teacher. Even the walls, it was like, the, what is that? Like we're breathing, like this. This is the kind of the feeling coming to you. And then, so much of fear coming. And fear, not that I should stop the meditation. No. Whether you stop the meditation, this is reality. Right? You do the meditation, this is reality. We stop the meditation, this is reality. Now, how to really, and with this, then all the miseries, the negative thoughts, imprints, miseries. This is what samsara is. Now, how we explain this morning, as per what we, what we understand samsara, nirvana, this morning in the practice, the morning practice, as per that, my understanding, that's what very gross, extremely gross, yet it's so powerful. I could not really, literally, I could not con the, the continue to practice. It's not that, it's not that, okay, I can praise, so I'm, I must get away from the fear. No, it's so overwhelming, so overwhelming. Yet the feeling was that whether I do this practice, not do this practice, this impermanence is reality. This is what, you know, what governs, what pervades all composite phenomena. So unless we do something to get out some sorrow together, this is the reality, very scary. And then in one week, I, I stopped the practice, I went to see, not really stopped, just little, what, what do you call it, break, not really for the sake of break, but to meet with my teacher, to get some you know, advice. And then my teacher, Gyalam Rinpoche, he saw me and said, oh, Dorsi, what happened to you? You should be sitting for a retreat. And then just within one week, one week you came up. Then I report all these things. I report all my, the situation. And then the, the, my teacher, what he said is that, okay, this impermanence, yes, impermanence, uh, the experience that you are sharing, yeah, this is a very good experience. Um, but you were sharing about the feeling overwhelmed, the fear and so forth. That's in a way is very good. Uh, but how many hours you are sleeping? He asked me, he asked me all these, because he's an experienced meditator. How many hours are you sleeping? And I said, I go to bed like 11 o'clock, get up at 5 o'clock. Then he said, okay, you're very young. I was just like 20, 19 or 20. He said, you're very young, your body needs more sleep. So you go to bed at 10. And then they say the, so because with this meditations, mind, they affect the body inside. And for this, we have to cool down the body, tone down the body. For that matter, then he suggested me some diets, how to go about change with the diets and so forth. And what diet? No choice, right? So the, there's no, okay, this diet, not this diet, no. Uh, hardly you get a diet. This was the situation. Anyway, he himself supported, although he was um, the hermit. The hermit, he did not have any resources. He also supported a little bit to supplement my diet to make sure that this, the body is, you know, uh, coping with the meditation. Okay, so um, what I'm say saying that these meditations, for example, with the impermanence, the, the feeling is so intense. And that, from my little experience, what I would say is that this is something that can come to us, potentially come to us, not really by being in a community or by being in a society. So there, our mind can easily be affected by the environment. Because the environment, the, the 99.999 people, they live in the world of permanence, right? Or my the house, better house, they will like for 1,000 years house, you know, lasting 1,000 years, 10,000 years.
So this, this is the basic framework of the mind. And our mind is so weak, we can easily be affected by these. So therefore, isolation. Whereas emptiness is very different. Emptiness, you need, in, you need very extensive studies. Very extensive studies. And people live in the world of, a world of objective existence. Everything is objective existence for everybody. Like, now I would say always leave 0 0.0018 space. Because there could be somebody realize beings, they say deliberately coming to help beings in as well as they are ordinary. So that is a point zero zero one. Otherwise, the rest of us, 99.999% of the people, they live in the world, everything is so objectified, so solid there. This is how we live. This can affect our mind. This can affect our mind. One, we are the one who contributes to, to this effect. So then when you meditate on the emptiness, we need in the first place, to get there, to get to emptiness, to get to emptiness is not that difficult in terms of intellectual understanding. Conviction is not that, that difficult. Only the experience part requires a conducive area. For the emptiness, with, because of the extensive studies involved and many years of studies involved, that already makes you quite a stable person. Quite a stable person. Then even if you are in a community, you can have the experience of emptiness. You meditate, you med of course, with a proper system, systematic, systematically, you can get the experience of emptiness. Of course, it may be very gross. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. This is how we have to go. Get there, get there. So it can be very gross. It doesn't matter. So you get it. OK, how things appear to me, that's not really true. Right? These thoughts come into being. Then you intensify more, study more, and study more. And where you think that, OK, now I'm getting some experience, you need to double check with you know, learned and experienced teachers as to what I'm experiencing is really the, the case, or something, something's wrong, or to go deeper. All this must be double checked. And the best book for us to have double checked is, the best source for us to have double checked is the writings of Lama Tsongkhapa. Writings of Lama Tsongkhapa. There are many writings, even from the Giluk tradition. But experience of emptiness, experience-wise, go for Lama Tsongkhapa's books. To really see that where you are going, whether you go in the correct direction, not correct direction, where you end up with, all will be validated, validated or evaluated by the books left by Lama Tsongkhapa. This is very special book. And Acharya Ari Nagarjuna's books, Ari Nagarjuna's books, they are too condensed. They are like the coating, coating of the computer. Right? Ordinary people cannot get access to them. So you read Ari Nagarjuna's, Ari Nagarjuna's writings, they are so complicated. Right? And study of the Lama Tsongkhapa's books, then go to study Acharya Chandragita's books, then alongside study Acharya the Borisar Shantideva's chapter 9. So this is how we study, and then go to Aranagarjuna. Then sometimes unlocking of Aranagarjuna's one verse, one verse can happen once in a while, right? Not all unlocking happen. Only one, so one verse or two verse. Suddenly you see that, wow, this is amazing. This tense I've been saying this all these many years doesn't make any sense to me. Today, wow, it's amazing. Everything is condensed in this stanza. These thoughts can come to you once in a while. Aranagarjuna's one is quoting. So therefore, we have, for us ordinary beings, the best book, very reliable, in-depth, in-depth and easily accessible is Lama Tsongkhapa's books on emptiness. And even for Bodhicitta, even for Bodhicitta, there are many books of all the traditions. And for the beginners, you read Lama Tsongkhapa's book on Bodhicitta, it will not make any sense to you. It's so intellectual, it will not make sense to you. But you read other books in the beginning. Then, as you really get into there, you get somewhere, and then you start feeling something, you get some understanding, then you start to see the, the potential, what do you call it? Potential loopholes or potential hurdles. Potential hurdle, hurdles, you cannot go any further, then read Lama Tsongkhapa's books on Bodhicitta. You'll get all the answers there. So compassionate. One point. One point, Lama Tsongkhapa's, one of the books is known as Lekshe, the, the Lekshe Nyingbo, Essence of the Eloquent Speech. Essence of the Eloquent Speech. Well, there are two translations of this. I wish this book is translated into English. Thus far, no translation. One translation is there by the Robert Thurman, 
and one they won partly by only half. The first half was done by Jeffrey Hopkins. Okay. The I don't want to comment too much on this. The the translators, I don't want to comment on that part. Um, Bob Thurman's translation was done when he was very young. And the text is very, very profound. So they, I'm not too sure about his translation, to be very honest. Jeffrey Hopkins' translation was done more lately. Lately, lately meaning more late, much, much later as compared to uh, the Bob Thurman's translation. So Jeffrey Hopkins' translation usually, except for the language, except for the language, English language, the subject matter was is very accurate. So subject matter accuracy is so important. Um, this is what we can be pretty sure with the Jeff Hopkins translation. The English is little, you know, why he's a native English speaker, but the language is not too smooth because he is too loyal to the Tibetan language. His translations, they, a Tibetan read his translations, it, is, it flows so magic. But non tibetans read this, you get stuck everywhere. It's not a proper English, right? Okay, he's been so loyal to the, uh, the original Tibetan because of which is, is his strength, is his strength. Not because that his, his English is poor. He's a native English speaker. Okay, this is one thing. So I'm just, I wish that Jeffrey Hopkins would be able to do the second part also. Although the translation may not be English-wise smooth, but at least there's something there to you know, complete that we should be confident with the subject matter, accuracy of the subject matter. Accuracy is very important. Okay, I wish Tupten Jimba should translate it, but it's not there, yes. Sorry? Chinese, I'm not too sure. That you have to check. That you have to check, I'm not too sure. Yeah, well, this is another option. But again, who is the translator? Not easy. So therefore, you have to learn Tibetan. <laughs> okay. But still, I'm saying that although some people, they are little, what do you call it, uh, little pessimistic about dharma in English, but I personally would say that English is a beautiful language. It's a beautiful language, and now there's enough material for somebody, if you study, reflect, and meditate properly, you can become enlightened simply by learning in English. Guaranteed. Don't worry. That's guaranteed. So some people, they're very, they, they, they're very pessimistic. Oh, English, you will not get everything there in English. That's not true. Whereas if the teacher cannot convey properly in English, if the English is very, very, very broken, you know, then the, the subject matter is very heavy. It's very sophisticated. So the language should be equally sophisticated and the person should have the sophistication. If that is missing, then it's not the problem of the English. It's the problem of the, the individual person. And the person who's listening also, the, the English should be, you know, English, if, you, if the English is not so good, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You can learn. You can learn. And many people, they attend the, the, the Buddhist philosophy in English. The English, audience English also improves. Many people there said that I learn English from attending Tibetan classes. And I personally learn my English from the audience. I ask them, what is this? This is how I learn English. Okay, so what I'm saying is that in English, you don't have to worry. Okay, now we have to, without getting Tibetan, if we don't learn, don't learn Tibetan, then I can kind of become enlightened by relying on English. That's not true. Materials, there are enough materials, more than what is adequate. There are enough materials, good materials in English. If you practice, study, reflect, meditate properly, this English is good enough for one to become enlightened, fully enlightened, guaranteed, no worry. Yeah, but some people, they are not so positive with this. I'm very positive. Yeah, so you don't have to worry at all. This is not the hurdle. With English, not having Tibetan is not a hurdle. But if you have the Tibetan, then you don't really have to, you know, say, wait for the translator, wait for the English source, and so, so forth. It's easier. But even with English, you can become enlightened. Okay, so now, now, Compassion directed towards the mere sentient beings done. Now, if you if you have additional wisdom, 
That makes the compassion more profound. So the wisdom of impermanence, which I shared with you, with this realization of impermanence, where the all composite, any composite phenomena you look at, you see that they're moving like this. Move so fast, it's so scary. Then, who's under this? Who is under this experience in this reality of this momentary fast, momentariness? It's just the practitioner or everybody. Everybody is there. But others, they are going through the ignorance is bliss. They are not aware of that, so therefore it's bliss. Oh, it's nice weather, it's oh, pleasant. Okay, we'll go for, okay, I'm a little tired. We'll go for, a, uh, say, the 10-day uh, the vacation, vacation, holiday. If you realize emptiness, no place for holiday. Every, no way, the, even place for holiday also moving like this. Everything's moving like this. So the point is that the more you realize this, the more you realize this, the impermanence, then the compassion towards others deepens. It becomes very profound. Then, if you see somebody successful, it's just a source of misery for the other person, the success. Rather than, wow, it's amazing, why not me? It will not come. It's just a source of misery. What we call success, that is, in most cases, what we mundane success, that binds the person. That binds the person. Because the person becomes very busy. And no time to come for Praman Vartika. Yeah, that's what happens. Very busy, right? Whereas you don't get a job, you have nothing to do. Okay, Pramana Vartika, yes, I have time. <laughs> lucky, you are very lucky. You know, somebody. Yes, I know that most of you, you quit, you, you know, say took leave from long time ago. I know that. I learned from Sonam Lab. I know that. But, um, you know, it's not, it's partly joke, partly true. What we call it's a mundane success. Strictly speaking, from the point of view of the, re the reality of this, how scary it is to see the impermanence. From that point of view, <clears throat> it is like an ensnarement, entanglement. Okay. That is the number one. Number two, the compassion directed towards the phenomena. Phenomena here referring to the phenomena of impermanence, the realization of, imper the, realization of the phenomena of impermanence. Realization of the phenomenon of impermanence. So, the compassion directed, directed towards uh, compassion directed towards the phenomena. In, if you want to know the full form, it is compassion complemented by the wisdom of impermanence. Compassion complemented by the wisdom of the phenomena of impermanence. The first one is compassion not being complemented by the wisdom of impermanence or the wisdom of emptiness. Second compassion is the compassion complemented by the wisdom of impermanence. Complemented by the wisdom of impermanence, not complemented. Okay, this is a qualification. Second one is the compassion complemented by the wisdom of, empty, wisdom of impermanence, but not with the wisdom of emptiness. Compassion complemented by the wisdom of impermanence, but not with the wisdom of emptiness. Then the third one. Third one? What is the third one? What is the third compassion? What is the third compassion? Technical term. Non-referential compassion. What is this non-referential compassion? Non-referential compassion, there. Okay. Um, Non-referential compassion is on the basis of the experience of emptiness. So when you see that everything is from the object, nothing's really there. Nothing's really there. Nothing's really there. It's just what comes to our mind, just a mere perception. Just a mere perception. Mere perception, beyond the perception, there's nothing there. Literally nothing there from the object. From the object, nothing's really there. Okay, so this experience is so profound. So this is the most profound experience. Much more experience, much more deeper than the experience of impermanence. With impermanence, it will give you a sense of fear. With the experience of emptiness, fear will be dissolved. Right? Yet, you become very grounded. You are not affected by any external factors, internal factors, and so forth. 
Okay. Seeing the impermanence, so much of fear comes to you, you are still in the dream. You are still in the dream to see the impermanence. With the emptiness, you come out of the dream. You are not going to be affected by even the impermanence within the dream. That is the power of the wisdom of emptiness. It's so powerful that you are not going to be affected by anything in the dream. So this great saint, the great saint Arinagarjuna, Arinagarjuna, 2nd century AD, and the great saint Tilopa, 11th century AD, then the Naropa, the great saint Naropa, 11th century AD, teacher and student, how they explain this experience. They say that it is like, for example, if there's a cave which has been dark for all these eons and eons and eons of time, if it has remained dark for all these years, this is the, the metaphor for us being in the dream, sucked up in the dream, created by the self grasping ignorance for all these many lifetimes, innumerable lifetimes. So it is like we are being in the, the, the dark cave for all these many eons. Then they said that this is confidence that these saints display of the wisdom of emptiness. You just introduce one light there. The moment you introduce the light there in this cave, this darkness which had been chronically there in this cave for the last many eons will be instantly dispelled. The moment you wake up, however long you have been dreaming, all these nightmares of the dream, however long it might have been, will instantly be removed the moment you wake up. So this is the power of the wisdom of emptiness. Okay, so you, you have this experience, then you see how the sentient beings, for example, okay, for example, someone who's so hungry, who's so sick, and then just thinking of, you know, what a pain, what a pain, there is also in dream. Then a person who is very successful, very successful, I have this number of companies, that number of companies, I'm the CEO, this, 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 and so forth. Okay, billion, one, what, 15 billion dollars turnover, also sucked in the dream. Then somebody, no, all this, even this, the, the wealth, even this whole, this wealth, power, this all, impermanent, it's very scary, it's also in dream. Right? Also in dream. But which of the dream is better? The first one, acute pain. One. Number two, okay, good food, good house, good cars, and so many people there. You are the CEO. The next one is, what CEO? Even the CEO is also impermanent. Transitory movement, right? Everything is transitory moving. Okay. So tell me, which of the three dreams is better? Tell me, if you are given a choice, if you are given a choice, tonight you will have a dream whereby you are going to have a, the same, the, the what, HIV and you are just in the last moment of your life. This is going to be one dream. And the dream is where you go to the CEO of a company, right? And everybody is envious of you. Which dream do you want to choose? Tell me. And this dream is going to last you for three, uh, three hours. A CEO, yes, of course. For the pain, we don't want to go through pain even for one second. Acute pain, we don't want to go even for one second. Right? So the dream, the second dream must be better. Second dream and the third dream? Third dream with the impermanence, even what is even the CEO, right? Then when you, from the CEO, suddenly your company go into liquidation. Liquidation, the person who said, what is CEO, this impermanent, is not affected. But you are affected. Who said, I'm CEO, that is person affected. But the one who is meditating impermanence is not affected. I know this already. This is a part of impermanence, right? So what? CEO, not CEO, there's no difference. The third person is not going to be affected. Which is better? CEO or the third person? CEO tendency to go down. Which is better? Third one is much better. Now, the fourth one, you wake up. This pain in this dream is my dream. It's just coming from my mind. Literally, it's coming from my mind, not really there. And then what CEO? This is also coming from my mind. There's nothing really there. There's a billion dollars. Nothing there. It's just coming from my mind. And then even the impermanence, even this is coming from my mind. Wow, what a relief. Okay, which of the three, four cases you like to you prefer? The first? 
acute pain. Number two is CO. Number three, impermanence. And number four, waking up. Which is better? Waking up. Wake up, right? Okay. In this connection, I'd like to sh share with you. Okay, Alex, you, sure, so you, you and the Pavanila, the two of you are supposed to ask a question. Alex, what's the question? Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay. What exactly is samsara? Right? Samsara, there are so many layers, right? Okay, so the householders will say, that, oh, now, you know, okay, we are sucked in samsara, we in samsara, this one samsara, right? Okay, I have to take care of my family, right? I cannot attend the Brahmana Vartika, I have this responsibility, that responsibility, we in samsara, what to do? This one samsara, this very gross samsara, this is not really the real understanding of samsara. One. Then the, say, the, um, say, uh, the reflection on the, say, the, the lumrim, the first lumrim, part of lumrim meant for this small school person, second part of lumrim meant for the, the middle school person, third lumrim meant for the grade school person. Okay, first, lum, first part of lumrim is primarily about, say, the, how to get out, how to get out of the suffering, 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 primarily how to get out of the suffering, suffering. The first one. Second one is to how to get out of the, the second suffering and the third suffering. The second lamrim is to get out of how to get out of the second and the third. Second, third, the suffering change and the pervasive condition suffering. And third one is to get out of the cognitive obscuration. Okay, this lamrim. Now, they, with respect to the first one, what we spoke, okay, we are in samsara, we can't do anything, I have so much of household responsibilities. So this is one form of samsara, but this is not the ultimate understanding. The second one is with pretend to the, said, okay, we have to strive to take birth in the higher realm, better realm, in the three realms, it's terrible, not only this life. Even next life, the lower three realms, hungry ghost realm, hell, hell, hell realm, animal realm is very scary. This one's samsara. We have to get out of this. This one's samsara. Then third one is, okay, so the, wherever you go in samsara, wherever you go, whether, whether you, are, you, whether you are, uh, are in the lower realms, whether you are in the three higher realms, it's just the same. You are sucked up in the dream, right? You are certain, okay, the one thing is, okay, the one thing is, okay, wherever you, you go, you go in the high, high realm, again, sometime, you'll fall back, right? Again, you'll sometime. So what's the good about taking birth in the high realm? So every way, it's the same. Somehow you will, uh, the, it's just like attaining the, like what? What is that in the, huh? Merry-go-round? Roller coaster? And then the, what is that, the, in England there's a round, huh? Ferry swing, okay. Ferry wheel, okay, ferry wheel, you go up, go down, <laughs> go up, go down, right? If you don't realize emptiness, Pramana Vartika is amazing, it'll go up. <laughs> And then after a while, there, then you, you know, say, the, okay, go up, and then tendency to go down is very easy. How? The Shariputra, Shariputra, he, at the time of the Buddha, there was such a amazing renown that the Buddha is the perfect physician of the mind. And the, the regular physician, reg, regular doctor, there's another who is so famous and with the name, I forgot his name. Okay, he is the number one physician of the body. And Buddha is the number one physician of the mind. This is how he has always, you know, come together with the Buddha's name, together. This is his renown. And he was the student of Buddha Shakyamuni plus Shariputra. So, one day he passed away, this physician passed away. And, Shari, and this physician, believe it or not, his respect for his teacher Shariputra, you wouldn't believe. He is such a renowned, everybody respects him like a god. Yet, for him, his teacher Shariputra, when Shari, say he is riding on an elephant in those days, 
in those days, he being such respected, he got the he had the privilege of going to aeroplane, not aeroplanes, <laughs> elephants, the ele elephants, and so forth. So there he is riding on elephant, traveling through on riding on elephant, and then from distance, if could see his teacher, no time for him to get off properly. He would jump. He falls. Sometimes he falls. He, it doesn't matter. This is the amount of the respect that he had towards his teacher. To see that his teacher is coming, walking, I cannot be in the, on the elephant. He jumps. This is the amount of the respect. And then receiving teaching from his, his teachers, what a joy, what an elixir for him. Okay, so he passed away. He passed away. And Shariputra, through his clairvoyance, he could see that his student has taken birth in God realm has taken birth in God realm. So Shariputra, because the student was so connected with, the, with, the, with Shariputra, feeling what a, the devotion, respect and so forth, Shariputra felt the responsibility that, okay, after the responsibility to give teachings, more teachings to him. So through his medical power, he went to the God realm. God realm, okay, monk dress, and there's the begging ball and the, the staff. He was waiting on the road, and he could know that now he's coming. The, that the, his student's coming. Student is the one. Now the student is the God. God, the, God not in the form of the creator God, in the form of the desire realm God. Desire realm God. So in a chariot, so many the girls, boys, God boys, God girls, they're all there together, and in, with such a merriment there. And then they were passing by. And the, the, the Shariputra was so waiting there for his student. And the chariot passes by, and the other god and goddesses, they even did not look at Shariputra. They were so lost, lost in the merriment and these things. And the, the, the birth of this student, Shariputra's student, who was the, the physician, he, because of the karmic con connection, he just looked at Shariputra. He looked at Shariputra, nobody was looking at Shariputra. Everybody just sucked up drunk, drunk in this fascination of the youth, of the God, God realm. And this one, the reincarnation, the reincarnation or the, what, the birth of the Shariputra student, the physician, because of his karmic, very strong karmic connection, he just saw the sight of Shariputra and he waved his hand, bye-bye, and left. <laughs> Look, other God and Goddess, they even did not even see Shariputra there, such enlightened being there. And he was able to see him because of the karmic connection. But because being sucked up in the fascination, splendor of the God realm, what he did was that he just waved bye-bye and left. Finish. So this is the danger to take birth in the God and Goddess realm, pertaining to the Dharma practice. It's very dangerous. So there, because of the fascinations, because of the, the youth, because of the wonder, splendor, samsaric splendors of the samsara there in God and Goddess realm, wanting to say, feeling affinity to Dharma practice is so less, is so less. Okay. Okay, so we see that there are three levels of impermanence, not three levels of compassion, right? Differing in the profundity, differing in profundity, okay. Um, okay, now let's turn to, to um, page 35, stanza one through one, we read part of it. Now the line five, line five, through practice, the mind will have the nature of loving kindness. Nature of loving kindness, this has connotation of it will become very spontaneous, very spontaneous. For example, for us, feeling of I is very spontaneous. It becomes very natural within us. Feeling of I, feeling of anger. Okay, so the examples are given here, like, examples are given like, non-attachment for arahats. For arahats, attachment is, non-attachment is very natural coming. Feeling of non-attachment is very natural coming. And then the craving for the lustful, then the thought of repulsion for the practitioners of impurity. Say, uh, somebody who's meditating on the impurities of the, the world, impurity world, including yourself, others, 
Then the same, it reaches to such an extent that you see anybody, you see so impure, so impure. Okay. So from this, same once you once we are well learned in these realities, and then we reflect upon them, we gain conviction, and then we practice, 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 just think, 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 think. Thing and the experience is bound to happen. If you don't practice, then the experience will never come. So experience is bound. Now, but for the and then now the on the other side, some people they said, what is this studies in this is practice? What do you practice without having the materials to practice? What do you practice? You know, the practice can at the most become like what? The, say, the compassion directed towards the mere sentient beings. That's it. It cannot become profound. So study is so important. For a very profound meditation experience, meditative experience, you must have a rich conviction. Profound conviction. To have the profound conviction, you must have a rich learning. So precious. So therefore, if ever, even in future lifetimes, I personally would say this prayer a lot, that in future I'm, may I meet with the teachers who are extensively learned. This is so precious. So precious because sometimes even the, some people giving teachings as teachers, they dissuade their students because they themselves not learn it. So they dissuade their students from learning extensively. This is very, you know, a sad thing. Okay. Okay, so, okay, okay, fine, we, the next part. Reference number 58, second. Okay, second, this second came from where? Huh? Second came from where, this second, second means there must be first. Huh? Reference number? 30, okay. Why am I asking this, why am I asking this? Is for us to know how to use this book. Reference numbers, there's always, there's reason there why re these reference numbers are given. For me, when I was given this reference number, it was a tough job. Tough job. I give all the reference numbers, and again, I found very, one Im very important passage there which was not given re reference number, right? I can skip it, but no. It is a little tough, tough for me, but later on, so many people will be benefited out of this. I cannot risk to, you know, but let, risk that others don't receive the benefit. So although it's a tough time, again I have to go back. Again I have to change all the reference numbers. It's a very difficult job. So therefore, did you notice sometimes reference number 13 A, B? A, B is not really A, B. Because something is missing there, then I add this, it becomes 13, then 14. The 14, I have to change it to 15, which means that the remaining like 100 something, I have to change everything manually. Then in the process, I'm not too sure. I'm not too sure whether I'm doing it correctly. Everything can go wrong. So to keep everything safe as it is, I give A, B, right? So that it saves me time. It's just for that purpose. Okay, so giving these reference numbers is, whereas if you know how to use this, this is extremely beneficial. Okay, Mr. Peck, you have a question? Yes. Okay, Mike. Mike, 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 Mike. Oh, Geshe-la. Yesterday I was going through this reference, reference up and down. Oh. I, I, I noticed one was a, a mistype. Uh, oh. on, on page 13. Up uh, three zero. One three. One three, 13, yes. One three. Ah. Uh, uh, the, sec the second line from the bottom, the CF S reference. Uh, which one? The CF reference 38. Reference 30, 28. Th 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 38. Th which one? The reference 39 is the, no, the line. Okay. The second oh, line yes, from yes, the bottom. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. One, how from the favorable methods and wisdom, the results in the form of two benefits of, for self and others arise, Rev cross reference number 39. Uh, yeah, uh, I think it should be 30, 3, 0. Okay, we check it. 39. Oh, that's very helpful. Where is reference number 3, 0? 
page. Uh? Next page. Next page. Okay. Reference number three zero. Uh, three zero. The first one has four parts. The first one has four parts. Okay, that's interesting. Uh, the first one. How from favorable methods? What we gave is thirty nine. Let's see what is then thirty nine. Uh, first rejection. Okay, this is from thirty eight. Oh, I think the, the Mr. Peck, you notice very. Yes, that's very helpful. Thank you. This reference number we have to check. Check the reference number. Thank you. So all of you, if you notice these these errors there, just let me know so that we're going to publish it uh, the properly. Yes. We'll, uh, the it'll be better. It'll be improvised. Okay. Any more? That's very helpful. Okay. Meanwhile, we'll continue. Okay, reference number 58. Second, cultivating favorable actions of learning. Okay, this came from where? Reference number 30. What is reference number 30? Page 14. Reference number 30. Okay, this is what? Which number is that? The second. Second is what? Second is reference number 30. Uh, first has four parts. Within that, there are four parts. The first one, identifying great compassion as the wholesome intention of uh, reference, uh, wholesome, wholesome intention. So this is from the, the two lines of word of salutation. So the compassion is done. What is second? Uh, no, no, just tell me. Say the, from the word of two lines of the word of salutation, the main thesis is, that the, the, the one who has transformed into a reliable guide. Okay, this main thesis, yet to be done. For, to prove this thesis, we have the four points. Four points, what is the first one? The first one. Motivation of altruism to motivate by altruism to benefit all This is the first one. That is about the great compassion. Great compassion is done. Now what is the second? Teacher, what is the teacher? Referring to the wisdom of selflessness or the wisdom of emptiness. Okay, this is what we do. Number number one is about the great compassion. Number two is about the teacher. It says how the wholesome intention of great compassion gives rise to the wholesome action teacher. That is the wisdom of selflessness. Okay, this then you see you try to correlate all these four points. They are so well connected. Then you go back to the teacher. There you will see that whole text is in your hand. Whole subject matter of the text is in your hand. Okay, number two is the teacher, page 35, reference number 58. Second, cultivating favorable actions of learning, reflection, and meditation to become the teacher of the wisdom of selflessness for achieving omniscience. Okay, um, so for achieving omniscience, which is our goal, the, the motivation is the bodhicitta, great compassion, and then with this motivation, for example, you look at the biography of the Buddha. Buddha, out of compassion, he left the palace to look for the solution. And what solution was he looking for? The wisdom of emptiness to be taught to the beings. Okay, so this wisdom of emptiness, the wisdom of selflessness, or wisdom of emptiness, this is the actual path. So the, of all the teachings, of all the teachings, all the teachings can be classified into two. Teachings meant to cultivate the, meant as the liberating path, and the teachings meant as the ripening paths. Ripening and the liberating. In other words, all the paths, even the paths, paths, or the teachings can be classified into teachings meant for the liberating path, teachings meant for the ripening path. What is that liberating path? Liberating path is the wisdom of emptiness. Wisdom of emptiness. All other teachings are the ripening paths. What do you mean by ripening paths? Ripening paths are the paths which help us to ripen to understand the wisdom of emptiness. Help us, which help us, for example, impermanence. Studying impermanence Reflecting on impermanence, meditating on impermanence, this is the ripening factor for us to eventually get to understand emptiness. 
selflessness. Life was compassion. So what made the Buddha Shakyamuni discover the wisdom of emptiness? What made him discover the emptiness? Because of the great compassion. With great compassion he was looking for in what way I can benefit all sentient beings? In what way I can remove the suffering of all sentient beings? What's the solution to all the sufferings of sentient beings? Then finally he realized the wisdom emptiness. So, wisdom emptiness, no, uh, yes, wisdom emptiness. It was driven by the compassion. So compassion was the ripening factor to connect him to the wisdom of emptiness. So finally, what really liberated us from samsara, from all the mental defilements, is the wisdom of emptiness. This is the, this is the liberating path. This is the liberating path. Okay, sometimes there's a, the, um, I don't know how many of you have heard about such things. Say there's a statue there, the statue is known as the, the, uh, the statue of the liberation at sight. Liberation at sight. You just see it and you'll be liberated. And these statues are there. Uh, statues, oh this statue is the uh, Tongtul. In Tibetan is, this is Tongtul. Tongtul means liberation at sight. You see it and you'll be liberated. Wow, this is amazing. <laughs> no wisdom is required. Just see this stage and you're liberated. And then some, some scriptures are there. This is total liberation at hearing. You hear it and you're liberated. OK. I would say, in my assessment, right? OK, my assessment is that these are given these labels, liberation at sight, liberation here, and so forth. Uh, who's ever said it? If the person who's, who said this, who said this, is highly realized, what I would say is that they said this out of incredible compassion towards the beings. Because for them, they know how difficult it is to understand Pramanavartika. They know how difficult it is to understand emptiness. Right? And yet, they, they love for sentient beings. They cannot bear to see the sentient beings suffering. They become so helpless. They become so desperate. I want to liberate them. I want to liberate them. Right? And then they create, you know, some kind of statue. Look, come, 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 come. Connect with this statue. This is the liberation at sight. Then everybody, they want shortcut. Right? Everybody, they want shortcut. Right? Okay, wow, I'm so fortunate, liberation at that side, <laughs> right? Okay, so what happens? They're connected. If they say, oh, there's a statue there, yeah, I also have my statue in my house, right? They will not be interested. Whereas, and in the house, how, for how long they spend time really looking at the statue? Not much. They're busy with other things. Whereas there's a statue there, liberation at the side. This is shown only, this is exposed only in one time in 12 years. You know that? There are many things like that. One time exposed only in 12 years. Wow, it's been so fortunate. We should not miss it. You buy the ticket, flight ticket, all these things. Same statue you stay in your house. You have, you, you, you have access to this. There's no difference in the Buddha statue. Guaranteed, there's no difference. Buddha himself said it. There's no difference in the Buddha statue. But when you said it, you have, then this, the eagerness is built. Built towards pups. Buying tickets and so forth. Is it for the pubs or for the Buddha statue? For the Buddha statue, for a good thing. Meanwhile, so much of, say, the, the uh, virtuous activities are activated. If every movement with great excitement, every movement towards the Buddha statue is happening. This incredible great skill. Incredible great skill. And some texts are referred to as the liberation at hear, hearing. Liberation. You hear it once, and instantly you'll be liberated. So people will be so happy. And if somebody dies, there's a liberation hearing. Anybody recites this, the dead will be liberated. And dead, dead, if the dead can be liberated, we easily liberate because our thought is even more active. More active than the, the dead person. All the great saints, they say that if you want to do virtue, do the virtue while you're still alive. Right? And if this is the liberation at the hearing, then why not you, somebody who is so alive, who can have a real faith, the dead person, even if the clear light is there, this clear light is totally disconnected with the sound. The blessings are there, no doubt. These texts, they're coming from the great saints. The blessings are there, no doubt. 
But when you say this, if there is no textbook text with the, the label, liberation adhering, then people will not take interest to read books, read text. Even the reading the text, this is the way to open our eyes of the wisdom to dispel the darkness. It's so precious. I personally, when I see this, I'm not contemptuous. I'm not, you know, the, the contemptuous or I'm not being denial of these things. I feel so, so uh, grateful to whosoever said it. So skillful, so compassionate. It's amazingly great compassion. But the reality is that just somebody reset Brahmana Vartika, right? Uh, through familiarization of the, the, the preceding moments, the metal of uh, such as this, this. Okay, this is easier. The, uh, the early ones, even reading the commentary, still we don't understand it. Somebody explained to explain, we don't understand it. Uh, how can we possibly think of transformation of this mind simply because of hearing some words which you don't understand at all? Right? Reality, realistically speaking, this is the case. So what we do, the best thing that we can do is see what would be the impression of the great teachers, enlightened beings, if they see what, you, what we are doing here, as opposed to somebody just fast reading, they're reading the Kanjuru Tenju so fast, right? Not knowing the meaning. No meaning is reflected. So these teachers will be, okay, just yesterday, I was talking to somebody in America, and he is, I wouldn't say a saint, but somebody who is very, very, very special. He's a physicist and also exposed to the Buddhist philosophy, practice for almost like 40 years. So I was just telling him that they, he's now in his 70s. I, I tell him that we are doing Pramana Vartika for a seven day course here. He said that this is so precious, so precious. In this world, where do we see people studying Pramana Vartika? Only in the monastic institutions. Otherwise, where do we see that? So this is so precious. He was so, so happy. He just rejoiced. So this, be, this is the practical, the practical reality. So what I'm saying, uh, finally, it is through one's own effort. What effort? We'll see. Whatever is required, sense of 58, no, reference number 58, there, there are the four points there. The first point, the cause for the one with great compassion to engage in acts of practice of the wisdom of emptiness. With this great compassion, what, now what should we be doing? We should actually look for the path, teaching of which will liberate the beings. What is that path? The wisdom of selflessness, the wisdom of emptiness. Okay, number one. Number two, establishing. Once you identify that, okay, now it is the wisdom. Finally, with this great compassion, I should benefit the sentient beings. I should remove the suffering of sentient beings. The next question is what? Hey, if somebody is so intensely saying that I must, I must liberate the, the problems of others, I must liberate the problems of others, I should free the problems of others, what would be your question? How are we going to do this? So you have to look for the means. Number two, establishing how to practice the wisdom through learning, reflection. First, how to, how to practice the wisdom through learning and reflection. Two things. Then, number three. What is number three? Number three is how the results are achieved through meditation practice. Number three, study, reflection, and meditation. These three components are required. Number two tells us Study, reflection. Number three tells us the meditation. How the results are achieved through meditational practice of what was previously established through learning and reflection. Once you learn, learning will give you the materials to, the materials. Then number, what is number two after learning? Reflection. Reflection will give us the conviction, confidence, conviction. Then with the conviction, then you have to walk, then with the conviction, conviction that you gained, it should be made spontaneous. Okay, let's say, let's say, how many of you, how many of you know simple mathematics, plus and minus? Just raise your hands. I promise, not more than the, the number will not be as complicated as number six and beyond. Just one, two, three, four, five. How many of you are conf confident with this plus and minus calculation? Very good. We'll do this exercise very quick. Ready? Sit upright. 
we'll do this the calculation. OK. You give me the answer only when I ask you what's the answer. Right? Till then, keep it, do the calculation mentally. Don't say anything verbally. OK, 2 plus 2 plus 3 plus 2 minus 1 plus 2 minus 3 plus 1 minus 2. What's the answer? Six. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's amazing. Wow. Okay, this is easy, right? It's not difficult. Okay, let's do it again. Ready? Don't take it lightly. Be more alert. Okay, 2 plus 2 plus 3 minus 1 plus 2 plus 3 minus 1 plus 2 plus 3 minus 1 plus 3 plus 1 plus 3. What's the answer? Why no answer? It's the same. I did not increase the number to like 6, 7, 8, 20, 30. I didn't say this. Very simple number. Why you cannot say this? Why can you cannot do the calculation in the second time? Why not? Because I'm saying too fast, and your mind cannot catch up with the, the pace at which I'm saying. Which means that it is not spontaneous. This calculation is not happening spontaneous. It works slowly. It works slowly. You know how to do it. You know it means you have the conviction. I can do it. If you give me five minutes, I'll do it. You have the conviction. But it's not fast. Right? So now, uh, what is this wisdom of emptiness for? What is the wisdom of emptiness for? Huh? To counteract self-grasping ignorance. And the self-grasping ignorance, how many, you, how many of us here have the self-grasping ignorance? <laughs> we all have the self. Hey, Alex, he's pretending as though like he's, he doesn't have the self-grasping ignorance. <laughs> okay, we all have the self-grasping ignorance. OK, tell me. Self-grasping ignorance, how does this arise? Does it wait for me to say something and slowly the self-grasping ignorance comes? Or how does it arise? Very intense and very intense, no, very fast and very intense. How do we know that? How do we know the self-grasping ignorance comes very fast and intense? They are the, what do you call that? The what do you call it? To test the, the to see what is the, the light, what is the, the electricity strength, the electricity, what do you call that machine? Huh? Wall meter, right? So there should be the meter there to see whether there's electricity, how high is how the so likewise the these measuring instruments are there. So what is me measuring we we don't know what whether self grasping is coming or not coming. We don't know that. But there are measuring instruments there within us. What is that instrument? You know? Yes. Attachment, anger, jealousy, fear. These are the measuring instruments. These will tell us self-grasping ignorance, what is the, the, the intensity? What is the how fast? This will tell us. Right? When these emotions are very fast, these are moved by the self-grasping ignorance. So self-grasping ignorance is so effective. So somebody says, what for did you go to Chen Sui Temple? What did you go there? What for? Pramanavada. What is Pramanavartika? What is this? If somebody says like this, what is your reaction? <laughs> what is your reaction? How dare you say this? How dare you say this? Do you know what Pramanavartika is? Do you know that? Have you seen this? Have you seen this? How dare you say like this? And do you, did you have to wait? Do you have to wait? Do you have to wait? OK, first let me meditate on anger. And slowly anger arises. Oh, it's very spontaneous. Very spontaneous and intense. This is that instrument to check how effective is yourself, is our self grasp ignorance. It's so effective, right? And this self grasp ignorance is creating problems. So, to get rid of the self grasp ignorance. So, how to get rid of this? By introducing the counterforce. And what is, if the, what is the, the quality of the counterforce? It's so slow, right? At 5.30, <laughs> right? 5.30, and then the 5.30, OK. Pfft. OK, and then the 15 minutes. <laughs> and 15 minutes, it goes like this. 15 minutes, it goes like this. Oh, and the five minutes. <laughs> right? right? OK, first they are doing the prostration. So this, OK, I'll skip the prostration. Right? <laughs> 
<laughs> so this is uh, this is with some emptiness. Look, this is some emptiness. Still, there is some emptiness not there. Anger already arose. Agitation already arose. <sighs> okay, I'm just <asleep. laughs> right. Okay. So there is some still with some emptiness not there. And then you come here, make prostration. Still, there is some emptiness not there. Right? And then we say, oh, Ye Dharma, <laughs> still the wisdom is not there. Although we are saying, oh, Ye Niroda, Niroda meaning the cessation, <laughs> still cessation is not there. Cessation, forget about cessation, even the, the wisdom empty is not coming to us. Right? And then the, uh, then the med- five minutes meditation, okay, then we start dozing off. <laughs> No wisdom emptiness. No wisdom emptiness. Okay. Okay. My mind is hanging up. What to do? <laughs> right? Okay. And then slowly, then the renunciation. Okay. Bodhicitta. <laughs> no wisdom emptiness. Okay. Then the wisdom emptiness. Where is the cell? You don't find. Oh, yeah. Right? Yes. <laughs> Just briefly it comes. Very briefly it comes. Very brilliant. That is wisdom emptiness. Look how long it takes. And the intensity is so feeble. When the counter force is very effective. Come and went. And wisdom emptiness is yet to come. Right? Robert has come, stolen everything, broke the house, left. And the police come. And then after two hours, the police come. Right? What happened? Where's the DNA? What DNA? <laughs> the robot is gone. <laughs> right? This is what we, what's happened to us. Okay. So now, so, but do we have the wisdom? Yes. How? Study this. It doesn't matter. It is not that effective. Don't worry. Study. After studying, with study, you will get the materials. Materials with which to gain conviction. Once the materials are gathered through studies, then you reflect on well. Reflect well. From this, then you gain conviction. Once you gain conviction, okay, although my mind is not so fast, the wisdom is not so fast, but I'm convinced that what I'm seeing is not the reality. The reality is very different. This conviction comes to you. With this conviction now, this is the reflection effect of the reflection. With the reflection, then what is, what is required? To make this conviction fast and intense. How to make it? Habituate in this. This is the meditation. Study, reflection, and meditation. Okay, some people, they talk about direct, right? This is the warning that I'm giving you. Some people, they talk about, why this, what is this? Study, reflection, they're all conceptual. Cut through the conceptuality, go direct into the direct realization. Direct realization, right? Cut through the conceptuality. Wow, the words are so powerful, very powerful. Cut through the conceptual, go direct into the, real, the realization, which means the gate, para gate, not gate, gate. Skip all these, <laughs> right? And then people are so fascinated. These teachings are not for us. We prepare ourselves for this teaching. There is a next phase. But people, many people, they seem mesmerized by this. Cut through this amazing, powerful word. Cut through the conceptuality, right? What is all this study, reflection? They're all conceptual. Yesterday, what we learned is all inferential cognitions are always conceptual. We said it. You remember? All inferential cognition. Inferential, the first experience of emptiness that we get is always inferential, which is conceptual. That is so precious, and this is going to be simply nullified by saying that cut through. Cut through meaning, cut through the conceptuality, go into the direct, right? These are all conceptual. This is how people are being so misled, misguided. And people are so fascinated, wow, this is amazing. What amazing, what do you get? Does it really affect your anger? Anger subsides. Your agitation subsides. When we go through problems, your agitation subsides or not? If the agitation, there's no effect in your agitation, subsiding agitation, subsiding anger and so, so forth, you remain the same person, something is wrong. You are not fit for this teaching. You are not fit for this teaching. So we have to do something where your agitation subsides. And the great teachers of these teachings, when they see somebody studying like this, they feel such joy, the great teachers. Whereas some, they will say, what is this? 
What are the Nagarjuna? This is not one with this, this is not different from this, this is not table, that is not table, what is this? Some teachers say like this, I heard it myself, it's so sad. People are being misled. The only path, the only panacea that can take somebody to the, the freedom of suffering, even that has been separated through these words. So we should be really very careful. And particularly, I would say that people like you, you have a huge responsibility. You are bound to meet with other people. They will first meet you rather than meeting with the good teachers. They will first meet you. And then, if you're, if you're able to tell them that don't be fascinated by these things, these things that there, but your emotions remain the same, that's the point. If you're able to convince them, then you can direct them to a proper channel. Many people, they even don't go to the teachings of His Holiness as Dalai Lama. What the teachings of His Holiness Dalai Lama teaches is all about bodhicitta, wisdom, it's all conceptual. They say like this, right? They cut. The final authority of the teachings of the Buddha, who really manifests as the Buddha's teachings, is His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Even this teaching, which is the most brilliant, severed. What's the point? This all His Holiness, only bodhicitta, wisdom, emptiness, right? What is this? All conceptual, cut through. These are the is some areas that we need to take. Care of. If possible, I would suggest you, if you ever meet with these people. First thing that we can do is see if you can direct them towards, say, towards the teachings of His Holiness the Dalai Lama. If you can do this much, this is your greatest contribution gift for these people, right? For the sentient beings, for the service dharma. This is so important. Yes, Skin? When you, when you refer to cut through, are you saying that the Dzogchen teaching cut through is not suitable? No, no. They say some teachers who don't see the doctrine teaching is incredibly precious teaching. Mahamudra teaching is incredibly great teaching. Some teachers who don't see, who I don't know what level of the real they themselves have in the first place. Then number two, not seeing the level of the audience, they talk all these things. This is, this teaching, in this context, this is something which is very harmful. This teaching in this context, in the context where the teacher himself, questionable whether they realize or not, one. These words, powerful words, very easy, I can say these powerful words. But I'm not realized. And the students, are they at that level? Nowadays, it's public. Public means anybody can come. In those days, it's not that. Not allowed. Only if you have gone through all these earlier preliminaries, only then the teachers will select the students who are, comp who are capable. Not like nowadays, it's public. And then because of this look, people, they said, okay, in fact, there is one, I know one friend, and then the, the person was so devoted. Initially, they were so interested in these teachings. And then, the, because that we are so close, I told them, and the person was also teaching you know, other students. Then I told that teacher that finally, now we are growing, growing older, and we should make sure that at least we have some flavor of emptiness. I said this, and we have to spend like at least five, 10 minutes a day on emptiness meditation. Imagine what the answer was given to me. Answer was, I know who the teacher was, said that, Oh yeah, but my teacher has given a special teaching for me. I'm just practicing this. I know some people of the same teacher who earlier into these teachings like the standard Nalanda tradition teachings, they were so much into that. And then with this teacher, taught something. I know what is taught, I know that. I know that. What is taught? Taught that. And this is the ultimate finish. They just stop studying all these things. Start. And this person is even encouraging others. When the Nalanda Master's course was introduced, they are so interested. And then, therefore, them, the immediate person was that person. Who well, then, OK, yeah, that would be good. But you can, maybe you can do later, like this. They even discouraging others from doing this. In fact, one is accumulating enormous negative karma of severing the opportunity for somebody to go to the path of liberation. That's what's happening. So as a result, in future lifetimes, you will not at all come in contact with the genuine dharma. This is the danger. Yeah. OK.
Okay, we'll stop here.